So um, again, I'm going to hand over to Jeppe, who's going to be uh, leading this uh, discussion. I can, uh, we can come around and uh, have questions afterwards if there are any questions. Um, but we will uh, hand over to Jeppe, who has uh, a handle and control on the situation. I hope so, at <laughs> least. <laughs> I hope that is better than my control of this this mic thing. Yeah. Thank you for still being with us. Uh, it seems like now we're, we're, we're dressed a bit more adequately for dealing with some of these topics. Uh, the first question I would like us to go into is about this kind of uh, visual art and games and how do they how do they connect in a way? Because obviously, one of the reasons for computer games, uh, for even having the discussion about whether it's art, is because it looks like art to a large degree. It's it's visual culture. But uh, regarding the intersection between fine art and games, I I I, I like to take it a bit um, scholastic and say like. What are what are the similarities? I've just said a little bit about that, but what are some of the differences? Maybe. Mm. Stine, in your PhD, you asked uh, a lot of the game makers, Master. <laughs> masters. <laughs> I just, just take it. Yes. Yes. But you asked uh, in your in your master thesis, you asked the game makers this question. But do you have an opinion of your own also? Uh, yeah. So as, as I said, uh, uh, like I I stated at the beginning of my thesis that I'm I'm not going to answer this question. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> and uh, before I came here, I I th I, I tried to think a bit about wh what I think now, and. I don't think I have, I want to answer that question now even. Because as I said uh, when we talked uh, earlier, that um, it, it's, it's interesting to, to like reflect about, but it's, I don't think it's very interesting to uh, arrive at the uh, kind of end destination. <laughs> No. <laughs> because there are so many opinions and and uh, different uh, perspectives and uh, so many different perspectives from different people uh, and as I mentioned uh, just the perspective of the person making the game and the person playing the game uh, and also the people uh, like uh, game um, uh, journalists, uh, like uh, researchers in game, we fi find so many different opinions. So I, 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 I think I think it's uh, as uh, uh, Colin said in my thesis is it's why do we have to? But it's it's interesting to talk about. I think it's interesting to reflect upon it. I think the uh, uh, the differentiation or the, uh, the, the when when we're trying to say our art is is games art. Uh, I'm coming from an art background, and uh, it's going to be a constant discussion, uh, and it's going to have this banal aspect to it constantly in the same way that we discuss what is art and why is art. Um, I, I, th I think I uh, am on board with Colin in that respect, that, w that why do we need to, to define it as, as, as such? Um, I think that uh, that this exhibition talks about that in, uh, in a very interesting way uh, in asking um, artists uh, who are exhibiting to uh, to show how computer games have influenced them in some way, but not actually to depict uh, video games uh, as art, as you were saying. Uh, there's no... Um, uh, screenshots of uh, of um, specific games placed up onto a wall, um, because to do so w would 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 be banal in its sense. Um, so I think that the the ongoing question of uh, within this topic of uh, whether computer games are art, uh, yes, and no, and does it matter? 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you must not also misunderstand me because I'm not looking for clear-cut definitions. Mm -hmm. I'll leave that to society. Mm -hmm. But maybe even inspired by this seminar, we could ask, like, uh, what's, what's the danger of playing around with it? Are we, uh, are we afraid of... Um, are we actually afraid of, of, of that, it, that it will have a, a, like a limiting connotation if we call them art? Then I, let, let me take another approach because, uh, Mattis, you've made games. Uh, do you consider your games art? It's a good question. Um, in some respect, I think so, yeah. Um, but it depends on, on the player. <laughs> I think it's up to the player to, to, to uh, w what is their connection with the thing I made. If it asks them some questions or give them some per new perspectives or uh, influences them in some way, I think it can be considered a piece of art, but it can also be a product or an experience or a design. Uh, I, I think it can be both <laughs> or none or, or only. <laughs> yeah. Or a medium for your music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like... Um, our what we perceive as art, if you look at art history, is also kind of in a flux. It it changes a lot, and I know that uh, Miguel, you're not a you're not an art historian, but you but you've at least studied the kind of development of of technology in a way. Can you draw a comparison between the two? Like, uh, is our is our understanding of art? Uh, changing again, and if this is the new art, what does it contain? Right, know? okay, so um, now you've given me the opportunity to say uh, <laughs> a very outrageous thing, hopefully. Yes. Um, I really like the, the, the... So I used to be very invested in the discussion of, like, can video games be art and so on, until I realized that it might be the wrong discussion, because it has a lot to do with perception and, and the institutions that host art and therefore sort of... And however, as everybody else has said, there's something about how people experience these things and, and other opinions. And then uh, uh, two years ago, uh, academically and philosophically speaking, the problem was solved. <laughs> so there's this book called uh, Games, Agency as Art by an American philosopher called Tai Nguyen. And he wrote that the aesthetic quality of art, so the reason, the, sorry, of games, the reason why games are aesthetic is that they are the, the, the art form of agency. So what you do with, with games is you create forms of agency that then you can explore. And in, that's their, their aesthetic form. And when games explore those forms of agency, when, when players get something out of them, then they become art. And then, so to me, like, okay, that's problem solved. Then the rest is kind of like institutions putting certain things in, in museums. But you can see it also in this exhibition, right? So the pieces, um, that, that of, of your uh, collective, right? They, they are not games, but they are forms of agency that conduce to play. And therefore, they belong in this space as, as an aesthetic expression. So I know I'm not answering to your question, but I just really wanted to say that <laughs> from a philosophical perspective, the sort of the question of the aesthetics of games, to me, it solves. It's like, wow, that was great. Now we can, <laughs> now we can have a proper discussion on when and what can we put on a museum as the, 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 you know, the aesthetic form of agency. Mm. Which games can we put in, in a museum as the aesthetic forms of agency? Yes. But I mean, since you brought it up, then I will elaborate a bit on that, uh, on that uh, exhibition because I feel like what we often do, it's an old idea that we've been doing for many years, is that we create something that connotes games, mm. but we don't actually put in rules, like there is no winning condition. Uh, there is also a book, I think it's James P. Carr's might not be true, but there's a book that's called uh, Finite and Infinite Games. Yes. I don't know if you've read yep. it. Yeah. And what we like to point at is, is, is kind of the, the open-ended infinite game. You could also consider a role-playing game being an, an infinite game because there's no win condition. You can, you can play it all your life and then you'll die at some point and it might not be over. <laughs> is this, could, could, could this be an inspirational point for art? Like is the difference is the difference between computer games and art like the games that are not art could that maybe be that there is a winning condition in most of them? 
you could irritate a lot of people with that sentence. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you think about like the, and you probably know the canon of the games as art, right? The things that are exhibited at the Smithsonian. So passage and braid and even journey and all of these things, they all have an ending. I'm not going to say out loud my opinions about <laughs> whether those games are art or not. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because th I'm on the record. <laughs> I can get in trouble. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Yeah. I think of a game like um, the Fallout series. Um, I'm thinking of Fallout 4 because that's one I played a lot of. And um, that game had an ending that was programmed by the programmers of the game but uh, a lot of people who were playing the game were also programmers or developers themselves and decided that no actually we don't want it to end hmm. so then added in their own aspects to it um, uh, a lot of people who did that are now uh, uh, this is a side side note are now working for the company that created Fallout 4 um, because of how good their uh, their aspects of uh, of setting uh, setting in the game have have happened, so I think the actual player doesn't want the game to end in in, in certain ways, um, unless it has a, a, a streamlined story. And uh, Fallout Four definitely did not have a very good streamlined <laughs> story. Um, but uh, um, but then uh, in, in 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 if we're talking about massive online multiplayer games. I was really interested in what you were saying about, you know, eventually you, you could be playing it forever and then you die. Mm. Um, I'm thinking back to, to your game and, uh, and finding uh, this bracelet that was uh, your grandfather's. Uh, I was thinking about how fun it would be that uh, later on your great-grandchild uh, turns on your computer and then finds your character and starts... Uh, Carrying on the, <laughs> the legacy of uh, of playing uh, playing a, what would be an incredibly archaic game to them, uh, I think that's quite quite uh, a beautiful thing. Mm. Yeah. Yes, and it, uh, that also makes me think, uh, like like somehow mm, th this continuous process that we like in art, we we think that it's good art. For example, a painting that you go to see it, it gives you one thing. And then you might come back a year later or ten years later, and it will give you s something completely new. In that in in that medium, uh, the the actual object of art hasn't changed at all. The only thing that's changed is yourself somehow. But um, but in games, uh, for example, uh, Fallout or, or 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 Vampire the Masquerade, your options will give you different results. So that means you are actually exploring a new <coughs> part of the art piece. It could be a little bit like um, like, like there is something you notice in the corner of the painting that you haven't seen before. Uh, but, it's, but it's much more elaborate, of course, because like that's, that's it's intended somehow in the game. But that, that kind of, for me, brings it also back to, to, to the aesthetic, in a way. Uh, because that particular game, I think, survived. I don't know if you know it. Have you played the Vampire the Masquerade computer game? Any of you? Am I the only one? <laughs> <laughs> There's one there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that one really thrives on an iconicity because it's very square, uh, because it's old, and it's very dark, but somehow that functions in a universe where you have to be a vampire that goes out uh, at night. So the iconicity is kind of a, you could say, like um, form and content goes hand in hand, in a way. Uh, Stina, you are also dealing with like different aesthetics from, from, from different game makers. Did they, did they ever talk about that, like the, the quality in terms of what they're making? Uh, yeah, um, of course, uh, they had different kinds of companies so they made different kinds of games so some of them made very simple games for example uh, uh, the civil engineers uh, Eric and Howard, they made uh, this uh, uh, game with a mouse who was going to navigate a maze for NTNU because they have this uh, the, the Moser uh, Nobel Prize winner couples uh, yeah their, their research is about like the grid cells in the brain so they made a game to like communicate that 
and I've actually played that game. It's really, really simple, so it's like a really basic. Uh, so that's in one end. And then you have the uh, other end. I, I interviewed a couple of people who worked for uh, Funcom and uh, Frontier Developments, and, and uh, they made really elaborate photorealistic uh, <laughs> animations and, uh, and backgrounds. And they are part of large teams, so they can like focus on their specific uh, part and their, their specific expertise. Uh, so I saw that uh, uh, they had different kinds of games just because they were like small and large companies with more expertise. And they also had uh, the more artistic people like Ingrid and Nina, uh, who worked for the company that used programmers as slaves. <laughs> uh, who uh, who um, uh, had this more like cartoon like uh, uh, style, for example. Uh, so uh, it varied uh, because of what kind of competence they had and what kind of resources they had to actually make the aesthetics. Because if you don't have that much uh, aesthetic competence like Hovard and Eric, then you end up with kind of a <laughs> kind of basic project. Uh, while uh, Nina and Ingrid had really cool uh, stylistic choices that their programmers were enslaved to realize. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, if that answered your question. Well, I think it does yeah. in, in a way, and it, it, made, it made me think about this, <laughs> like um, the different materiality of uh, computer games, uh, in like comparing that to more traditional genres. Because like the open-endedness is also sort of in the code, like you can um, w if you if you paint a painting, the the paint will dry at some point. If you make sculptures out of clay, it will become unmanipulative at some point. But with uh, digital things, you can keep on working on them uh, as long as your programs don't like go out of uh, <laughs> like uh, copyright or, or updates, uh, the, the constant updates that we have right now. So, so like how that also b brings out the question like when when do you set down the good ending point in the process of developing games? Maybe how do you know when to end it? When to know? Um, uh, that's a good question. When when do you s stop? <laughs> uh, in, in my case, I had a very uh, in both my my games have been very uh, structured in a way that I knew. Uh, the ending uh, or the endings in in in, in uh, bracelet, uh, so I knew where I had to sort of uh, put the the, uh, the punction uh, mark, but um, in other games I think you just have to um, you 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 test and you play and you re replay and you s uh, find out where what is it that we're making. I I have colleagues in in the game industry that. They they sort of work very organically with with their games. They uh, create uh, sort of rules, and then play test the hell out of it, and just see where is the fun in this. Is yeah, and they just sort of uh, shape the uh, shape the game after play testing it, and then it's more uh, usually the end comes when you're out of money. That's what yeah we you, we can make <laughs> twenty <laughs> levels out of this, and then we're done. We don't yeah, <laughs> so that's like yes. the practical <laughs> end for for many uh, game developers. I think of those um, simple uh, puzzle-based games that have come out on phones lately that, uh, that don't seemingly have any sort of end. But uh, even if they don't have a pre-programmed end to them, they're constantly getting, you're getting onto a higher level, there's more things happening on the screen. I'm talking about these games which are pattern-based games where you're having to, Fruit Ninja is one of them, and then further on and further on, there's various different games like this. Seemingly simple games, but there's there's more happening within them as you go further into the game. But I read uh, an article recently that was talking about them, and it was saying that there is an end to them. It's when the device that you're using can no longer uh take the uh, keep programming the game um so that the device you're using crashes so uh, usually this will happen on a phone because a phone doesn't tend to have the same sort of computable power as uh, as a pc 
So you, you can keep playing the game for a certain point and your phone will just overheat and die. Which I find quite <laughs> fascinating. Um, I wanted to quickly go back to, um, you were talking about um, uh, how uh, games, uh, how art, you can go back to it and, uh, and get something different out of it. Um, I wrote uh, an essay not so long ago on how uh, public art is very much about this, um, how there's no such thing as uh, site-specific because a site changes over time. Um, so you can't have anything that's site-specific because when you come back a week later, the site will be completely different. Therefore, it's not site-specific. It's site-responsive to a time-responsive. Uh, computer games have a different problem in that technology advances. So the problem with going back to a computer game and playing it afterwards is it's usually quite crap. Your nostalgic experience of playing it uh, uh, is not what you think of it is actually. I recently played Metal Gear Solid again for the first time in like 20 years, and uh, and it was appalling. <laughs> <laughs> really oh, it's bad. still brilliant. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just these these uh, the story's fantastic, but the uh, the actual quality of the game is uh, is so poor. But uh, but then there's games such as Tetris, which is one of these puzzle based games. Which is uh, there is a Tetris on every single console that has ever existed. There is a version of Tetris, so it shows that this game is is uh, outlasting time, mm -hmm. and it is just simple blocks on a screen as opposed to other games that came out of the same s similar sort of time that uh, um, I tried to play Asteroids on an Atari recently and it does not have the same sort of uh, weight as it did when I was seven. Um, so I think that, yes, you can go back to art and look at it in a different way. Uh, you can go back to computer games in a different way, but usually you won't have the same sort of love as you first had when you were first playing the game. No. Mm. But that also, in a way, speaks to the selection of uh, like which games do we do we perceive as uh, would it be a stretch to call it a masterpiece mm. in a way something that is so basic that it has defined a lot of things that come after that's the question of the canon and that's another uh, <laughs> who, who puts what in the canon <laughs> and, and who decides what's canonic i think one interesting point in this conversation that you're hinting at is that of of uh, conservation because mm. i'm my aesthetics of games, so the, w the games I aesthetically love are, among others, the indie games between, say, 2006 and 2011 made on Game Maker or similar horrible tools by that day and published on obscure websites for download. They are all gone. All of the games that I thought, you know, that I still think are, are, are masterpieces of, of the medium, they're gone, mm. uh, with the exception of three or four that were carefully curated, that you can run on emulators, that people have kept active. So our memory in, in, in games, it's, it's kind of like distorted by the fact that we cannot necessarily access some of these games that were foundational. Um, even th so we, st we, we stick to the, to the Tetris or, mm -hmm. or Asteroids, while there were maybe dozens of other games that actually had an impact on how game makers saw their, their craft afterwards um, so so to me that's that's uh, that's fairly important to to remember that what we consider to be the canon is very partial and determined by the the way we can conserve and preserve these these artifacts mm. but why don't we preserve them better Miguel uh, well <laughs> so first because um, <coughs> Uh, we don't we don't have the institutions that say we should well I mean we do have now but back in the day we didn't right we, that should be preserved and that should not be preserved G games have always been seen as this kind of like uh, waste of time or like quirky expression or like you know you you'll be a real artist when you stop making games and you'll make something like more serious right and then <coughs> it it's taken us too long to acknowledge that games are aesthetic objects and therefore we now realize, oh, wait, we should, we should recap these things. But then they evaporate. And then the other thing is that a lot of these games were distributed on, on the internet circa 2005, which died 
horribly in, in uh, from you know in the era of the platforms and the Facebookification of 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 the internet and so on. So mm. when when people stop having their own GeoCities website and and similar own websites to download stuff, all of that is like poof mm. and disappear. Yeah. So so there is no there is no memory of that. No. And then people like me are also guilty because we don't put them in our curriculums. Mm. You know, we, we too easily just end up putting Fallout or mm. anything easy instead of saying, no, you have to play the original Flight Wrench, not that <laughs> remake, because <laughs> that was a game. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but it's funny. It makes me think about, like, the, the, the new PlayStation. I think uh, you can play on the older versions. You can take a PlayStation 1 game, or is it another? Xbox. It's an Xbox. Yeah. Okay. That's they call it something like re retro. Yeah, 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 yeah. Readable. Yeah. Mm, I have a friend who was active in the beginning of uh, Ultima Online, yeah. which was one of the first online games. And what he has done is he's put up four computers that run on I think it's uh, Windows 92 or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> and then he might be looking for parts to actually yeah. but it but they can never be connected to the internet mm. because the moment that they get connected to the internet they will automatically start to update and that will ruin some of the code yeah mm. so 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 there's a deep problematic here at least mm. somehow in that it there's like um an, like a push forward mm. within the technological sphere which mm. damages the old pieces in a different way than we're used to when it comes to material art. And also games themselves change because uh, you can't play an original game that has been updated now and, and fixed and changed in many ways. Hmm. So games are really um, ethereal. <laughs> they uh, are very fragile uh, objects. So that's a big problem with, uh, with preservation because uh, they don't exist anymore. They mm. actually don't. You can't play even new games now. You can't play the, the older version of it because if you try to download it, you, it always, you always get the latest uh, version, which has mm. been changed in many ways. Mm. Yeah. So with this progression thought, uh, is it because we're afraid of seeming, s seeming old if we say, like, uh, no, you have to play <laughs> Pac-Man? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not afraid of seeming old, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. No, I I think it has to do as a as somebody who teaches people in a games program. Um, I am always concerned about um, how n moderately narrow the perspective of students can be when they come to an education that that shows them games. Mm. So. When you look at film and media studies, the, the, the kids who go to those studies, they have watched all kinds of weird movies from all the time, art house and everything, and, and that's their jam, right? Mm. But the kids we get in games, most of them are totally into AAA games. And mm. that's like, there's very little to work there when, when you say, oh, you have to play this, this sort of 8-bit looking game because look at what it does with game mechanics. Mm. It's like... Mm -hmm. But it looks horrible. Yeah, but it doesn't matter how it looks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you sound old. And, <laughs> <grumpy> and, <so. laughs> and one last thing about this is also like that I don't think we ever thought about our own mortality in this. I don't know if any of you have played uh, Pillars of Eternity. It's a crowdsourced game. Uh, so that means that a lot of the people who have invested in them, they have their names written in plaques if you go to certain scenes in there. But since a lot of them have died, it's become sort of a moratorium, mm. like a memorial. It's actually quite gnarly mm. if you <laughs> go into it, <laughs> because there will be personal, personal messages saying like, oh, you hosted so many good role-playing games, and oh, you did that. So like with this, I think, I think the, um, it, it kind of also touches upon like the, um, the title of the exhibition downstairs, like this, No Death, Only Respawn. In this game, we're playing around with immortality, right? But we are kind of mortal. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it really hard to pose this into questions. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I sh we should swap seats. <laughs> some of <Yes>. us. <laughs> Let's move on a bit, shall we? Uh, because we all agree, like, on the recreational quality of computer games. It's a kind of a psychological double bottom 
uh, you could say, like uh, if somebody says that they enjoy Tetris, then they probably enjoy Tetris. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's the recreational part of computer games. But what are other benefits that we can be had to, uh, from playing computer games? Have you come across anything? <laughs> so, so I always say that um, my, my usual quip these days is that um, the importance of play is that we don't have to play, and that it, that's exactly why it matters. So, so the fact that it, it's not forced, that we don't have to, that nobody tells us we ought to do it, that that's exactly why play is important and why games are important because we don't have to play them. Mm. It's an active choice. How 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 often do we have this kind of active choices about our free time, our you know decisions, our agency in the world? It's, it's so seldom. So to me, that's the that the the, the importance of games is that they are uh, unimportant and unserious. Hmm. That also mo almost sounds a bit seductive I to hope me. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because. Mm, yeah, I, I think uh, I think uh, games can be important and serious, and yeah, um, it depends on what you uh, are looking for when you are looking for games. But for me, at least, and I th I know I have some people with me in this. Uh, I uh, think games are really good at conveying uh, a story of a life other than your own. Um, for example, I I. Uh, played uh, like a firewatch uh, then I have to be this uh, 40 something year old man uh, with a d dead wife who walks into the wilderness and s sits in this uh, firewatch tower that's not my life that's <laughs> another life <laughs> and I played uh, life is strange too I have to be a teenage boy uh <laughs> <laughs> with teenage boy feelings uh, and uh, who experiences something traumatic and it's not any teenage boy, it's, it's uh, someone with a has Hispanic background who uh, experiences racism. And for example, uh, a part in the game where you are confronted by some very racist, uh, hostile people, and they ask you to uh, demean yourself. And I feel I don't want to demean myself, I will, I will uh, challenge them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I saw someone mention that uh, white people play this differently than people with, for example, a has Hispanic background. Interesting. Because they know what it's like. You have to, we have to play along because this is, this is dangerous. Mm. They will, they can kill me. Yeah. And I will, I will stand my ground. And they, they beat the shit out of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, th and that's, that's opens, hopefully it opens people's eyes because this is the experience of mm. so many people around us that we don't get to experience in our everyday lives, but we can experience uh, an aspect of it, at least, uh, uh, through games. And that's, uh, I th think games does that quite well. Yeah, and, and that particular game even gives you an afterthought, because when you finish each uh, segment, it will tell you how many percentage of players chose this option compared to yourself, right? So you had the thought coming uh, right after. Because I also remember a scene there where I, I had the choice of begging for food. And I was like, I want to see what that's like. <laughs> 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 but that was a minority decision <laughs> somehow. <laughs> not, not a lot of people wanted to do that. But I think what you're saying also touches upon like this kind of like fluid identity that, that's maybe an, an, an ideal for us as a society. Like We kind of also want to see what the other side is like. Uh, I've been reading uh, Vinicott lately, a book called Playing and Reality. And in that he has a therapy session uh, with a person who has a male gender, but he, he's, he's, he suddenly plays as if he's a girl. And that becomes sort of a, a nexus of interpreting how the therapy session is going to be like. And I think that book is from 50s or something like that. So, so also when we see like this kind of new, um, like gender gender change happening with uh, the new generations and and the much more fluid view, uh, view, you could almost see it as being prophetic somehow. But in this case, it was social. It was social class and it was ethnicity, right? Mm. 
that you would assume on yourself? Are we are we going that way as a society? Wiggers? <laughs> <laughs> I think the uh, uh, the aspect of role playing uh, is is a major thing within within video games, but within playing with computers in general. And I think that it's just become a, another tool for that. And uh, role playing has been around for the entirety of, of human culture, uh, trying to exist as something else. In some cultures, it would be seen as meditation, to pretend to be a tiger, or whatever, or to put yourself in in uh, in the role of, of of something else. And I think that uh, computers and video games have given us that um, opportunity in uh, in much very interesting ways. Um, you know, and nobody knows that you're a dog on the internet. Um, I. Th I think also that uh, that would be a premise for uh, for why the uh, th the playing video games is is a good action for everybody, not just for young people trying to figure out who they are. But this is uh, a utopian idea whether uh, whether it's actually something that can is actually happening is something I don't have the answer for. Mm. Yeah, because that was also my thought that it's like uh, there is a pitfall in it also, which is that um, like you you have this power of choice and whatever you do your 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 labor kind of comes with a with a guarantee of having an effect on on your society, but if we create these artificial worlds and then they have none of that in the real life, what kind of what kind of society are we building from that? I thought you would have an uh, some I d opinion I on that. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I know you keep looking at me. Yes. I, I don't have a. I, I I have a number of of opinions about the society we are creating. <laughs> and game, games tend or playable. Play playable media have a. Have a role in it, but again, as I mentioned in my in my presentation, the, the thing we need to talk about is capitalism. Then we can talk about play in in digital capitalism mm. right? so so if we want to go there I'll be happy to yeah, how long do we have uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I don't mind so much because I feel like what, what, what games are doing is that they're kind of a they're a science of fun right and what this what states are interested in what institutions are interested in is kind of the engagement uh, to uh, towards how can you get people to be engaged in for example society you know that's the positive angle. So the the and I'm happy that there's people still optimistic about things. I I am I am I am less optimistic sometimes. And so what I think it's like we we like to put uh, the, our current time into into sort of clearly defined boxes like post capitalism or digital capitalism and, and surveillance capitalism. So I I I use the label playful capitalism as one of them mm. because. I think the 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 danger of the world we are living in is that corporations that <laughs> thrive under these current economic conditions, which are basically corporations that are uh, exploitative and predatory and and tend to uh, um, enhance inequality by gathering and resources and and encouraging uh, Political situations of of uh, neo or proto fascism. In in this particular context, these corporations see play and playable media as an instrument for people to perform the actions they require for this particular uh, socio economic or political economic agenda for the sake of fun. So we we are given toys to play, and not only we are distracted. That's the that's the sort of uh, 1984 argument. I think the, the, the Brave New World argument is more important. We are not only distracted, we are producing the conditions of our own exploitation by playing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's where we are going. So this power of, of games, of exploring possible worlds, it's weaponized against us. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, 
it's it's being used to give us Call of Duty as the the best commentary on American foreign policy mm. or <laughs> the normalization of of digital surveillance through uh, watchdogs or in less obvious sort of thematic terms, right? The, the video games that are used to train machine learning systems are essentially camouflaging labor as play. So we can help corporations develop systems so they can gather our data in more efficient ways. So, so it's all fucked up. <laughs> 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 We're uh, slowly rounding out of time. So okay. um, should we open it to us? I floor? think we should open <laughs> it to the floor and see if there's any, uh, any questions from the audience here. Yes. Uh, yeah, this goes a bit uh, to Stina, but we talked about um, games exhibitions, uh, about the staticness of what you experienced during the games exhibition. Do you have any thoughts on how a game exhibition could be more balanced so you don't get this, oh, I'm playing this game and everyone is looking at me stressed, but also not the, oh, this is just concept art and I'm only looking and not interacting? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I don't necessarily have the answer. I think, uh, of course, this is uh, subjective, my subjective opinions. Uh, but it's also kind of having a critical eye on what you are, what what am I actually exhibiting, and how? Uh, because I saw a lot of concept art be exhibited, and concept art can be interesting just to see what it's. W but it, it it's a tool. Concept art is a tool. Uh, concept art is a kind of a boundary object, if you will, uh, that is useful within the game making process. Uh, it makes it obvious for, for example, clients uh, or for investors or for the people who's going to program this. That what are we going to make? Uh, so it's it's a tool. Uh, but of course, there are, there is concept art that is really beautiful uh, that can be interesting to exhibit. Uh, I'm not saying that you should never uh, <laughs> exhibit concept art, um, uh, but also. Uh, kind of looking what you are taking away by, for example, uh, taking a screenshot from a game that is absolutely beautiful. Take a, a, a screenshot from Skyrim, for example. Skyrim can look incredibly beautiful and putting it on a wall. Um, but you lose the kind of aspect. You can't look around, for example. But you can. You could have a, a, I don't know what's possible, but you could have kind of a, environment that you lets you look, uh, use, use technology to let you look around, for example, look at the view. Um, uh, and also, uh, as I mentioned, it was quite disappointing for me that I won't be able to uh, try all these different uh, old uh, uh, game consoles, that you have just have to look at them through glass and look at these videos. And I can absolutely understand that the people owning these consoles don't want me to like, <laughs> uh, touch, <laughs> touch it and, and destroy it and break it. Uh, but could there be a way to emulate the experience of playing this old console, for example? So I think there's just uh, the, the, the limits of creativity, I think, and actually uh, thinking about what you are uh, taking away by uh, simplifying the experience that much, I think. Any other questions? Very silent. <laughs> I, of course, have more, but <laughs> maybe it's a good place. Uh, um, I have so much more I'd like to uh, to speak <laughs> about myself, but uh, I think uh, I think we're going to draw to a close and. Uh, I want to thank all of our guests and uh, thank our audience for coming and bearing with us. Um, I think it's been a fantastic uh, opportunity to have you all here. As you said, Jeppe, it was uh, generous, generous of you to, to give us uh, your viewpoints as well. And uh, I think um, it was a, a nice, nuanced uh, discussion. Um, and uh, I implore everybody to go downstairs have a little look at the exhibition and uh, and enjoy what is not a representation of games, but uh, 
exploring the inspiration of uh, playing and in this terms playing video games and how that can uh, can change uh, an artist's point of view and also the aesthetics of uh, art uh, of games and how that can be brought into the world but also exploring um, our uh, changing world and uh, what we how we see ourselves in in a digital age um, somebody said to me uh, recently um, oh we're, we're, we're learning we're leaning towards a virtual world um, and I came back and said uh, no uh, we're not leaning towards anything we are already there um, we are already cyborgs and we are already living in a virtual world and you can definitely see this within uh, um, how teenagers see the world because they have a device that they have an online uh, persona which is constantly changing and, uh, and is not real in terms of a physicality um, and that's part of their life which I find quite interesting but uh, again, thank you very much all for coming, and uh, we'll see. Uh, thank you very much to you all again, and uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, here's the shoot. Uh, I can do this in English also. Um, thank you all for joining us from Copenhagen and Trondheim and Oslo and Moss. And mm. uh, thank you all for coming. And also a special thank you to Nicholas Hughes, who has been my, as he mentioned in the beginning, my co-curator for the side events throughout this exhibition. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you and all of our conversations uh, on video games and visual arts and everything in between and all the overlaps. And um, you did credit all, uh, all our uh, supporters, uh, but I also want to specify that we would not have had you on our team had it not been for, and this is, I'm going to do this in Norwegian, Hospiteringsordningen for Kulturtalenter i Viken Fylkeskommune. That's a big jump. But yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you. That's it. Go see the exhibition. And uh, please come back <laughs> for our other exhibitions also. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>